All right, so we are live right now. Thank you for joining the Cornell Sports Business Society for what is our first ever digital panel. We are using Google Plus Hangout and live streaming in some fellow Cornellians who are working as TeamSide executives. Today's discussion is going to be on TeamSide innovation. We're going to go over some topics, best practices um, in team business operations. So today we are lucky to be joined by Tim McDermott, a 95 graduate from Cornell. He is the Chief Marketing and Innovation Officer of the Philadelphia 76ers. Um, Tim has also joined us on, on a Skype a few years back, so we're, we're lucky to have him back here. Um, second off, we have Eric Hewson, who is the VP of Ticket Sales and Service for the New Jersey Devils. Um, and lastly, we have Jason Pearl, a 91 graduate from Cornell. He's the Managing VP of corporate sponsorships and new business development for the San Francisco Giants. So, Tim, Eric, Jason, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. My pleasure. Absolutely. And um, to the students from the Cornell Sports Business Society who are live streaming us now, I say hello to you. And to other alumni, I'm sure the both of you are enjoying this as you watch now. So. What we are going to do is, like I said, we're going to jump into some topics, best practices um, that go into operating a, a team brand. Um, we're very lucky to be joined by these three Cornelian executives. And what we're going to do first off, um, just, just so everyone has a good idea of, of what it is that the three of you do, you all seem to have different roles within um, a, a team organization. So. First, I guess we'll start with you, Tim. If you can just sort of give the audience a, a description of your day-to-day -day responsibilities and, and what the objectives are of your position as Chief Marketing and Innovation Officer for the Philadelphia 76ers. Sure. Um, so I often talk about three goals, uh, brand, fans, and revenue, um, really increasing the overall brand strength, increasing the fan base, and then increasing revenue. And um, yeah, those three are very much intertwined in the world of sports. So um, on, a, on a more kind of tactical day-to-day, -day, you know, that means you know, how do we create wind in our sales to sell tickets, sponsorship, how do we, uh, how do we uh, we're advertising, marketing, uh, all of our digital efforts, uh, game entertainment, uh, PR, uh, public relations, community relations, foundation, um, our merchandise, our TV, radio, broadcasting, um, there's probably a couple of our, our CRM, all the analytics database type stuff as well. Um, so at the end of the day, those are the you know kind of the functional departments um, uh, to uh, you know as I said to really build that brand and uh, to ultimately drive revenue. Great, fantastic. Then I guess we'll jump next to Eric. If you could talk a little bit about you know your your day to day tasks and and objectives as VP of Ticket Sales and Service. Sure. So in the NBA, and I know similar to what Tim was talking about, our largest revenue uh, pool is our tickets. So I'm responsible for overseeing filling our bowl for all of our games and all of our events. And that involves selling tickets in the form of season tickets, uh, partial plans, single game tickets, group tickets. And it's everything from our pricing strategy to our marketing strategy to our promotional strategy in terms of how we're going to get more and more people in the building on a game-by-game -game basis. Separate from that is our retention area, so I oversee our service staff. So a big piece of filling the building is retaining your customers on a year-to-year -year basis, specifically your full season ticket holders. So a, a term that you hear very often in sports is what is your gate? Your gate is your revenue that you've brought in for ticket sales on a particular game. The best way for us to raise our gate is to raise the number of season ticket holders that we have. And so that's what our group is constantly focused on, is if we're able to retain more people each year and keep our retention rate, our gold standard is to get to 90%. It gives us an opportunity if we retain our season ticket holders at 90%, our new sales staff can bring on enough people to continue the base and the growth of the base to the, get to the point where we're in a sellout situation on an every game basis. So the larger your season ticket base, the more opportunity you have to sell out, the greater opportunity you have to get the greater uh, gate on a per game basis and the more revenue you're going to generate in your largest revenue generation bucket. Fantastic. And then I guess we'll end it with you, Jason, if you want to answer the same question. That'd be great. Sure thing. So uh, my primary responsibility is driving revenue, uh, mostly through sponsorship, but 
I also have business development in my title, meaning we're looking for other ways to to drive revenue for the club outside of the traditional tickets, uh, sponsorship, merchandise, and broadcast. So we're trying to look for unique ways to utilize our brand and to create new products that our fans may be interested in. Um, but sponsorship really is the core of what we do. My focus is to make sure that we're delivering uh, best-in-class activation programs for our partners and to grow those partnerships and to look for new avenues to drive sponsorship revenue. Uh, we sort of look, you know, we try to create some unique areas uh, here in San Francisco for us to do that. So we've got a core sort of in three pillars, technology being a, a critical aspect of what we do, uh, sustainability, secondly, would be some, uh, an area of focus for us. And lastly, which is nothing new, but it's a core for all of our franchises, how do we make sure that we are incorporating philanthropy into all of our partnerships? So those three pillars are uh, a goal of mine to make sure we incorporate in every sponsorship. Great, great. So second off, what I want to talk about and, and was hoping you all could touch on is um, in looking at the Sixers, the Devils, and, and the Giants, um, and when it comes to selling the brand and selling tickets and, and you know, generating interest from fans and, and partners, we find that the three of your organizations have been in some sort of unique situations. Um, I guess, you know, with Tim and the Sixers, I guess I, I could start with you. If you could talk a little bit about, you know, what your strategy has been for the Sixers and, and your group in, in terms of selling, you know, the promising future of the Sixers while also delivering to, you know, your current fans and investors, um, you know, during what you may consider a bit of a slide in terms of your team performance, you know, what has sort of been the balance, how have you approached that, and, um, you know, what, what is your strategy? Reed, you may consider it a slide, if that is probably fair to say, it is a bit of a <laughs> um, yeah, so, so, you know, yeah, we are in the midst of a 25-game uh, slide, as you put it, uh, losing streak. Uh, the, re the reality is, you know, we expected to come into this um, and be very transparent with our fan base, and very authentic, very transparent in terms of what our story is. Um, and, the, and it is a good story of the future and, and buying in now. Um, we've got the... Um, what will probably probably be the rookie of the year, Michael Carter Williams, a Syracuse grab. Um, we've got Nerlens Noel, who hasn't played yet, but was the sixth overall pick last year, uh, and really should have been number one if he wasn't hurt. And then, uh, and then next year, uh, or this coming uh, draft, we will have two um, lottery picks uh, or potential lottery picks. You know, certainly, we'll, we will have one. And then we get the uh, New Orleans Pelicans pick as long as it's not a top five pick. So in theory for next year, we could have four, uh, with Michael Carter Williams, four players on the court. Um, you know, we're well positioned from a salary cap perspective. And so you know, the hope is, is really what we are pushing, what we are selling, is that the fact is um, a lot of teams kind of waddle in this, you know, you're, you're number eight going into the playoffs or you're, or you're number 10 and you're just missing it. And uh, you're really never a true contender. And uh, there's a belief, right or wrong, that if you can really just kind of, uh, you know, kind of start over again, if you will, um, that we can really build something that's special. And so this year has really been about player development. And you know, a coach comes in every game. He busts his butt. He coaches incredibly hard. Players are playing hard. You see the effort. You see the energy. And um, and uh, it's been a really unique season because you are seeing the player development, and there's a bunch of different stats that we have that show how the guys are getting the system, they are developing. Um, that being said, I'm not going to, you know, it's, it is difficult. Um, I will say this, I, I think the best brands create a brand that is independent of wins and losses and is independent to a certain degree of players. Um, that's sometimes hard to do, but players come and go. Players get traded. Um, unfortunately, maybe a player gets hurt. So I personally, my perspective is to not necessarily build brands that are just about a single player or even players um, just for that reason. If you track revenue uh, across, we just did this the other day, we track all the revenue lines across the different teams, and you can see an amazing amount of correlation between a star performer that 
um, you know, maybe he gets traded, he gets hurt, he's out, and the revenue drop. If, if you go and look at um, the Cleveland Cavaliers and when LeBron got uh, went to Miami, I mean, you, you see what happens. And so I'm a big believer in building brands that are just deeper emotional brands. Um, and you can see there's you know there are brands like that in the you know, Green Bay Packers, Chicago Cubs, etc. There's some there are some brands that have done it really well. Great. And, and moving on to Eric, um, so you and, and the New Jersey Devils recently had a, a transitional period with, with regards to a new ownership group coming in. Um, in, in terms of your position and ticket sales and, and you know what you do, how exactly have you been maintaining these fan relationships? And as you mentioned earlier, a lot of it is you know retaining these season ticket holders. How exactly you know were you working and strategizing during this uncertain p transitional period? Well, it's been a tough time for our fans. Just the history of it is we had uh, owners that were 50-50 owners, uh, a man by the name of Jeff Vanderbeek. Um, and then Ray Chambers. Ray Chambers was really our money guy, so to speak. And they together brought our new arena to Newark. And Ray was more of a philanthropist. And once he got the arena to Newark, his decision was I kind of did my job in terms of starting to gentrify the area. And so I'm out. And so we lived in this two-year period where we had an owner in Jeff whose heart was in it. Uh, it was in it for the right reasons. He loved hockey. He loved the community. He loved being called Jersey's team and being the only team in New Jersey that was willing to call themselves Jersey's team. Um, and the challenge was he himself was not liquid enough um, to be able to front the fact that we had a building to pay for. We had the purchase of the team to pay for while running the day-to-day -day business operations. And so if you can imagine how difficult that was during a time period when the lockout was taking place last season, and fans were already up in uproar about the NHL in general and the finances of the NHL. We were in a difficult spot. Um, Tim talked about a little bit uh, in his market, but just in full disclosure, uh, Josh Harris and David Blitzer, the two gentlemen who purchased the 76ers, those are the folks that recently came in and purchased the Devils. And so in asking that question, in a way it's been a godsend. Um, it's actually been a breath of fresh air for us because we no longer have to ask the questions from an ownership perspective on is the team going to stay in the market. One of the reasons why I came here with the Devils um, and I changed over from the Phoenix Suns, I'm from this area originally, but I love a challenge. I love being told something, you can't get it done, and then diving in and figuring it out how you can get it done. And I noticed with the, with the Devils, it was always a team that was winning on the ice. You know, we won three Stanley Cups in 95, 2000, 2003, but the team wasn't selling out. And a lot of that, there's a bunch of different reasons that go into that. The Rangers have been in market for 80 years, and Philadelphia, the, the Flyers have been in market for over 60 years. And so here we are, this franchise, trying to kind of get in between the two of them geographically and create our own fan base. And so there was a lot of challenges that came along with that. And so having new owners come in became a breath of fresh air. But what we've been doing is we've been focusing from a PR perspective on getting the word out there about how great Josh and David are. First off, personally, having worked with those folks and been in meetings with them, I see how passionate and how committed to the brand they are. So it's easy for me to be able to talk about that with my staff and for my staff to be able to communicate that to our fans. Fans want to hear that. Fans want to know, despite the fact that the team is at a difficult time selling and a difficult time filling the building, do we have people here who are committed for the long run? And if they're committed for the long run, then you know what? I, as a fan, I'm raising my hand. I want to stay here too, and I want to be a part of it because it's a brand that I love. We've also incorporated Josh and David into a number of events that we've run. So everything from opening night to them dropping the puck on the ice to we're now having tenure events for season ticket holders where we're celebrating how long they've been with the organization. So we just had two events for 30-year season ticket holders and 25-year season ticket holders. They spoke at a State of the Franchise event where they got to speak about their vision. And their story is incredible. Their story is uh, uh, folks who started their own businesses, who have their family men, they live in the area, but they buy distressed assets and they bring in great management staffs. They pump in the resources that are needed and they see those resources and those assets turn around. And so it's fun to be a part of that. Um, it's fun to be on the side to be able to tell that story. And so I'd say as much as that's the storyline and you're asking 
um, what's the challenge been? It's actually been that breath of fresh air for us to be able to have a new message to be able to communicate to our fan base. Very interesting perspective. Thank you. And Jason, so uh, as we could see on your, your icon uh, on the lower third, uh, the Giants were recently world champions in 2012, 2010. Obviously, I had a dynasty guy, and I'm, I'm sorry to bring it up like I did to Tim, but obviously last year you did not perform up to what the expectations you put on yourselves and your fans, and in your case, maybe, you know, your, your business partners as well in terms of your cor corporate partners, and, and you know, you, you talked about some of your philanthropy partners and things like that. So what I want to know and, and what people are interested in knowing is sort of how do you keep fans optimistic towards, again, you are so used to the success, you had one down year, now you have opening day coming up. What has been the message that you've been bringing to your fans, to your business partners, um, again, to keep the optimism up and, and for them to restore that faith that they had originally had in, in the Giants? Uh, great, great question, Reed. Uh, you know, we've come up with a philosophy that we don't want to spoil our fans, so we're just going to do the World Championship thing every other year, <laughs> rather than every year. We don't want, you know, get carried away with it. Now, it, it you know, your, your question is a good one. And I, I, you know, just to speak to Tim's comments, it really has to be beyond wins and losses. And, and, and frankly, that's been our philosophy since the new ownership group took over this franchise in 93. And we started eyeing the, uh, the idea of building a new facility. And beyond just wins and losses, it also has to be uh, a marketing plan or a strategy that goes beyond the players. Um, and frankly, a little bit beyond the game itself, which is what is the experience like? And what we strive for here with the Giants and AT&T Park is win or lose, um, whether you're a baseball fan or not, that you walk out of this place and you feel like that was fun, I got my money's worth, I want to go back. And in many ways, I think we've created that. And we've got a great honeymoon going on. We had a lot of success early when we opened this ballpark in 2000. We had a tough streak in, you know, 2005 through 2008 and 2009. Uh, and, and the wins and losses, I'm not going to discount the value of that. Clearly, winning world championships has changed uh, the level of fan avidity around here dramatically. But I think the experience, more than anything else, uh, that our fans have when they come to this ballpark is critical. Uh, to answer your question about how are we looking into going into 2014, coming off, you know, it wasn't, wasn't an awful year. We had some injuries. We had some tough, tough uh, issues that came up the second half of last year. From a sponsorship standpoint, uh, you know, there's, there's tremendous value that we're still delivering. Uh, we will have 30,000 full season ticket holders for our ballpark uh, in 2014. Uh, the most in our history. Um, and all those are full season tickets, uh, which is a pretty amazing accomplishment. And our ticket sales folks have done an amazing job of delivering that. Our TV ratings have been uh, very strong for the last several years. Uh, and we didn't see much of a break in that, even with the downturn in performance last year. So. When I talk to sponsors going into 2014, we've got a lot of optimism. Now, can I say with a straight face that that's going to be the case if we have two, three seasons like we did last year? No, it'll be a little bit more difficult. But back to my point uh, that I made when I first spoke about how we try to differentiate ourselves when it comes to building partnerships, using things beyond what happens on the field, or, or in fact using what happens on the field to leverage technology, sustainability, and philanthropy is important. Um, so those are the things I try to cling to rather than wins and losses. But there's no doubt the numbers speak for themselves. So we've been very lucky uh, and fortunate from that perspective. That's great. Yeah, I mean, you touched upon technology, and, and the next topic I want to bring up, it, it might be best to uh, start with the Bay Area guy. Um, <laughs> so what we wanted to talk about was social media and, and other new forms of, of media and, and the different platforms that sports can be consumed on have Redefine, I guess, not only the capabilities of teams and sports, I, but but all brands in general. So, what I want to know is some of the initiatives that you know your group, the Giants, or whether it is your your sponsorship group specifically. What sort of initiatives have you taken to leverage this digital reach? That's a great question, and clearly an area that we love to focus on, given how much innovation is happening here in our backyard. 
um, not just the people who are creating innovation from a technology perspective, but our fan base, um, they're so great about being early adopters that this is a great location for people who want to focus on technology. I will tell you that um, when we opened the ballpark in 2000, there was a lot of discussion about, you know, bells and whistles that we can put into the ballpark and people approaching us about how this technology or that technology was really going to be cool. And we came up with this philosophy that um, when it came to technology, it had to be, quote, relevant technology. It had to enhance either our ability to deliver a great product or enhance the fans' experience when they came to the ballpark. Does it make it easier to get into the ballpark? Am I getting other stats? Am I getting other information that enhances my experience at the game? Am I going to be able to buy my hot dog and my beer faster than I could before? Those sort of things enhance the experience, so we try to focus on those things. Most recently, though, social media, I mean, that, that is really where everybody is headed, uh, and everybody's trying to figure out how do we utilize social media to um, interact and connect with our fans and enhance the experience, enhance our brand. Um, we've got uh, a couple people who are dedicated to social media here. Brian Sarabian, who's our director of social media, has been fantastic. Again, we're very lucky to be in an area of the country where you know Twitter's in our backyard, Facebook's in our backyard, um, and we're we're very well connected with those people uh, who help us look at this stuff and help us be strategic about it. Um, one cool thing we did last year. Um, was we were trying to figure out how do you take social media and all these fans who are following us and give them some sort of physical way to connect with us. So we created what the first of its kind uh, social media cafe at AT&T Park. We actually took a building inside the ballpark in center field, uh, which was a Build-A-Bear, and we took out the Build-A-Bear and we put in a, a cafe with multiple screens, we put a Mondo pad, an in-focus Mondo pad in there so people could see uh, what was going on in the social media world. And we're trying to figure out now how do we take that beyond showing people what are fans tweeting about, what are, uh, what are players tweeting about, what's the messaging that we're trying to get out there, but also give them a way that we can interact with them so that we're driving people who are in the ballpark to visit us at the Act Cafe, see that stuff, but you know, win prizes, um, meet a former player, uh, take photos, do interesting things, and then spread that virally through social media. So some of those are some of the things we're focused on. Great, thank you. And I guess just to mix up the order a little bit, I'll, I'll go next to Tim. Um, so Tim, you, you've sort of been in your new role. Uh, it's only been a few months or so. What has been your strategy um, with regards to social media as Chief Marketing and Innovation Officer? What have you been doing to engage fans? Um, is there anything new you're implementing that maybe wasn't in-house before. Um, if you could talk a little bit about that, that would be great. Um, yeah, I got to put it in context a little bit. Um, you know, a, because I've just been here three months, it's a little bit, you know, the first few months you're you're evaluating what you're doing a little bit. Um, and, uh, you know, as much as I want to, you know, climb Mount Rushmore here or no, Everest, <laughs> uh, you know, we've got some work to do um, just from a, you know, probably some basic blocking and tackling. Um, and just all you know, fairness. Um, so, having said that, I guess let me let me put it this way: is whether I was here, or whether you know, I was you know, former Philadelphia Eagles or at another team, Washington Capitals, wherever. I think the way that I'm I'm starting to look at this is, first of all, when people always ask about, hey, what's your digital strategy? I think I'm starting to come, and 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 I'm not so sure that that's the best question that people should be asking anymore, um, because Everything these days is digital, and so I, I heard this statement the other day. It's it's not what's your digital strategy. It's how are you marketing in a digital world, and and uh, and I think you have to do a little bit of level setting with when that question is asked of what's your digital strategy, what people mean, because what you'll find is for some people, the answer to that question is a content question, and they will default to things like creating. Um, you know, short story, long long form videos, whatever it may be, text, um, photos, um, social content, and and so that that in my mind, there's this digital ecosystem that can be broken into probably uh, ten to twelve different categories. Content creation being one of those, content creation distribution being one of those, but there's all these other categories, 
um, advertising is, is a, you know, another category. Like all the advertising, not all of it, but the lion's share of the advertising that we do is digital and has some element of predictive analytics that is built into it. Um, there's companies that you guys may be familiar with, like Rocket Fuel, um, who use artificial intelligence and analytics to predict um, and kind of learn what your uh, what the best advertising strategy should be. So, so my way of looking at this kind of concept of digital is there's this digital ecosystem, and and we're defining what those buckets and categories are. And I also think it's important that we're always pointed back to business objectives. For the longest time, digital was, and I did this as well. It's like I created a department, my digital department, right? Um, it's almost like going back into like the. Uh, you know, 1999, and everybody putting an E or an I in front of their company's name, or creating the E version of their company, <laughs> and uh, and and that's not what I think this is about. Like, this is about it's a new way of doing business in a in a digital paradigm, and so it's it's come start with what your core business objectives are because those haven't changed. We want to create. More revenue. We want to grow our fan base. We want to grow a great brand. It just so happens that we have all these digital platforms and digital tools and technologies to do that. And so that's my kind of lens or you know, the way that I'm seeing the world these days. Um, and having said that, part of my challenge, quite frankly, is just level setting with everybody that they see that world the same way that I'm seeing the world. Because as I mentioned, as soon as you start this conversation, people will default into you know, content production, which is, in my opinion, is just one part of that ecosystem. Great. And Eric, if you just want to jump in, sure. talk a little bit about your digital, or I shouldn't even say digital strategy. Right. What is you, how are you marketing to the digital world, Eric, <laughs> as I should phrase it? Good, good learning from uh, Tim's point of view. Of um, I think that the, when you look at the digital world, uh, to Tim's point, it's so wide, and we have to start with what our objectives are as an organization. Our objectives are to generate revenue, and the challenge with the social media is that it's difficult to monetize social media. Um, what's become the norm with social media is fans who engage with your brand, they want content from you. They want to hear from the players. They want to hear from staff members in terms of what's going on inside the organization. They want fun, cool videos with your mascot doing quirky things related to the team. They want insider information. You can drive folks to your social media page that way, and then on your social media pages, the cool thing about social media is it's replaced the water cooler, so to speak, in terms of where people and where fans like to talk with one another about what's going on with the team. But I'll say this, if you try and monetize social media specifically on the ticket sales side of things by directly messaging to them about upcoming opportunities, upcoming promotional nights, upcoming packages, you lose those folks. There's a certain piece of social media where fans want to feel like they're getting that special content, but they don't want to feel like they're being hounded for ticket sales messaging, for even sponsorship messaging for that matter. So. While revenue generation is important to us, we believe that revenue generation has to happen outside of social media, but we have to use social media as a tool to collect information on folks because we have so many people on there who are talking about the team and are relating to the team. So you might think, well, how do you make that happen? How do you talk to folks? How do you monetize that if you're not talking to them directly about your sales message through social media? So there are a number of companies out there, and I would say contests on your own is the first way to do it if you're not going to partner with a company. Something that we did right before the 11-12 season as we were making a run uh, toward the Stanley Cup final, we didn't know how far we'd be going in the playoffs, but we partnered with a company called Doodly, D-O-O-D-L-E dot L-Y, and they provided a social platform. It was kind of like Twitter for drawing, so you were able to draw your ideas and concepts and share it socially with everyone. And so we challenged our fans to create our playoff rally towel for our opening rounds of the playoffs. And we had our fans submit um, their go at what that rally towel would look like. Now in doing so, the catch was, in order for us to be able to contact those folks if they were the winners, 
we had them put in their information, their email address, their phone number, so that we could contact them if they had won or bring them to a game to honor them if they were in the top 10, which was the example there. Once we've collected their information, now they're used to being marketed to through the telephone, through email. So it's creating this content that they're coming there. It's understanding who these people are. And then the next step of that is, there's a company out there, Tim, I know your company uh, has been approached about it and we've been talking about it collectively, but there's a company out there called Gaga, if anyone wants to Google it. Um, what they're doing is they're taking it to the next step and they're working hand in hand with social media uh, brands and they're saying, we're going to create contests for you. We're going to help you collect the information on these folks, um, on their contact information within your social media contest. But then more importantly, that next step of it is we're going to be able to track their activity in the social world and we're going to put a score to it. And based on that score of who's being most active and who's talking most about the team, who's retweeting it most to their friends, we're going to give you a list of folks that we believe are those people who are directly uh, there for you to be able to go after and market to through your calls with your ticket sales agents or through your emails and your email marketing campaign. So again, I love social. I think social is here to stay. I think social is a great way to engage fans, give them that behind the scenes peek. I just don't um, employ selling directly through social media. I employ collecting the information and then through that information elsewhere, that's where we're going to attack them. Sound strategy. That, thank you very much for all your answers. And I guess moving on to the next topic, we'll segue into the in-stadium experience. I know Jason had just touched upon at Cafe a little bit. Um, some other initiatives were mentioned, but I was wondering just if you guys could touch upon maybe some other specific examples that your organization has taken in order to stay ahead of the curve to sell tickets or leverage partnerships, maybe in Jason's case, that, that are going to enhance um, the fan experience and, and retain these consumers. I guess I'll start off with uh, Jason, I guess, if, if you'd like to jump in. Sure. Uh, and Reed, I don't know if you want me to address any of the questions that are being asked along the way too, or do you want to wait to the end to do that? Um, we can wait till the, till the end, or if there's anything that, that's sort of relevant to what's been discussed, or if you want to tie it into what you're about to say one way or another, you know, feel free to do so. But um, well, I'm, I'm staring at Lauren's question about uh, Brian Wilson and 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 the and <laughs> the, beard, the beard campaign. Um, you know. It, it, as I as I mentioned earlier, and as Tim mentioned, trying to you know you, you know whether it's wins and losses or whether it's players specifically, I mean we are building personalities. Uh, you know the, the fans want to come because they want to see these players, and we really do focus on trying to build their personalities as much as possible. Now, in, in Brian's case, maybe we got a little bit overboard, if you will, uh, which was great for us at the time. Um, but we're trying to create other personalities and and new guys who are coming up and. You know, not necessarily replace what Brian Wilson meant to the Giants, but uh, there's other guys who we're focused on now, like uh, Tim Lincecum or Sergio Romo. So uh, we will, and hopefully a lot of this stuff happens organically. I mean, Cure the Beard was an organic campaign. It's not something that we came up with as a marketing strategy. Our fans come up with it, and we just try to leverage it and build upon it. Um, but back to your question. What are we doing uh, to enhance the ballpark? Uh, you know, I mentioned the Act Cafe. That was our huge initiative last year around technology. I also mentioned those three pillars, and I'll keep coming back to those. Sustainability being a major one for us. We've done a lot around solar. We've done a lot around composting and recycling. And this year, it's going to be about uh, the first of its kind, sustainable and edible garden in a sports facility. And uh, this was actually announced at the White House last year. We got lucky enough to be invited to the White House, and uh, Michelle Obama, who's focused on wellness and health, um, gave us an opportunity to talk about a new area of the ballpark in center field that we actually have pulled out traditional concession stands, and we're putting in a sustainable garden. And we're really excited about what that's going to mean for us. It's not as if we're having a garden that we're going to harvest, you know, produce to to uh, to serve to the fans. It's it's more of an educational opportunity and a fan uh, gathering point in the ballpark, but it's also a place where we are going to be able to work with sponsors to help elevate their platform when it comes to wellness. Uh, so that's something we're really excited about for the upcoming season. From a technology standpoint, um, you're going to hear, start hearing a lot more about iBeacon, 
and it's a, it's a technology that we're working with Major League Baseball Advanced Media on, where when you come to AT&T Park, you will be, uh, and, your, and, your, and your phone's on, you will be pinged, and you'll be pinged with a message that says, welcome to AT&T Park, we're excited about tonight's game, here's the matchup, and guess what, if you want to check in, here's what you do, and once you check in, then you are ha going to have the opportunity to engage with us Either, you know, it's going to be something to do with information for the game or it's going to be an opportunity to get some kind of discounted concession offer. Um, and ultimately, this is going to be a tool that fans will use to, um, you know, to build their relationship with the team even further. So at some point down the road, it becomes, hey, Reed, thanks for coming back to AT&T Park. Glad to see you. This is your, you know, your 10th game this year. So far, you are 8-2. and two. And whenever you show up, the Giants seem to hit a home run. Thanks for coming. And what do we do beyond that is yet to be determined. And will fans engage with us with that is yet to be determined. But love the idea that we're giving them a platform that they can opt into or not opt into, depending upon, you know, what their level of uh, interest is in that kind of activation. I will, I will add, if I can, one, one, one thing that's interesting when you get into kind of technology innovation in sports um, so when I was, this is probably back in 2004, we did the, uh, when I was at the Eagles, we did the first um, uh, implementation of, uh, you know, whatever you call it, a speed pass type concept where you could tap and go. Um, put a lot of money into it, and, and literally no one used it. Um, and so, you know, the, the caution for all of us, though, is I think, I think in the world that we're now living in, because where we have enablement, if that's the right word, but we have all these technologies that are now enabled, uh, or maybe you said differently, we have technologies enabling new fan uh, applications. It's really deciphering which of these will have uptake, which of these really will have demand. And, um, you know, again, it's, it's tricky because we can invest a lot of time and money into some of these, and there's just there's really not a, a great... Um, solution uh, or problem that we're solving. So I think one of the challenges that we have in going through this is we're now kind of this concept of like sports tech I think is starting to take off, which is great. Um, we've been talking about doing much more um, innovation lab type stuff, um, but actually deploying some of this stuff, having a filter or a criteria is tricky. Um, because even though it's technically possible to do stuff, is it going to work? Um, I don't know. Like iBeacon technology is definitely the, the, the new rage, the latest. Um, is it going to work? Is it is really interesting? I have I gotta tell you, I've spent more time in my first three months on any one topic is this topic around um, kind of data integration. And and what we're doing, we said, okay, we've got, we use uh, a platform and, and a ticketing platform called Pacuolan. I think, Eric, what do you guys use? Ticketmaster? Ticketmaster, yep. So everybody kind of has their own ticketing architecture or uh, platform. We then integrate that with our email automation platform, which is Adobe. Uh, it used to be called Neolane. Um, others use uh, Oracle, bought, uh, bought a company called Eloqua. Um, yeah, there's a whole bunch of them out there. So we have... Arctics, or sorry, in your case, you have Arctics. We have um, we have Pacuolan, we have Salesforce, which is a CRM platform, and we have email automation in uh, Adobe. And we're now going to build a, a data warehouse, so all this stuff works together. The idea of being able to do that is out of the data warehouse, you have you know good, clean, merge, purge data that then you can layer in business intelligence tools, but you can also come out of that data warehouse and um, it's basically a porting mechanism to have loyalty programs or database marketing programs, et cetera, that are built out of it. The biggest challenge in all of us in doing this, whether it's iBeacon technology, database marketing, loyalty programs, is it's starting to raise the question of how are organizations structured? Literally, who are the people we hire? What departments do they sit in? Because there's almost, you can almost imagine a layer between the data warehouse and all these fan applications, that is an automation layer. 
it's almost like a central command um, artificial intelligence natural language processing layer that sits in there that computes all this stuff in real time, uh, which is really fascinating to think about how you could possibly build all that. It's a great point, Tim, and, I, and, and, and you, you really touched upon something and back to that point I made about relevant technology, and that's really the hard thing to decipher, though. Like, what is going to be something that's relevant to our fans and that people are going to uptick, take, you know, really take advantage of? And the one example I'd use, which we're, we're, we're also lucky enough to have AT&T as our, as our naming rights partner, well, when we need the naming rights change, I mean, this was originally Pacific Bell Park, then it became SBC Park, and now it's AT&T Park. And when we did that first name chain, SBC put this this crazy new technology in our ballpark called Wi-Fi. <laughs> people are like, Wi-Fi? Well, what, what, what am I going to do with Wi-Fi? What, how do I use that? And in the first couple years, the only people using it were our Uber fans who were coming in with their laptops that were Wi-Fi enabled and trying to get additional statistics and stuff like that. But as that technology continued to grow, I mean, where would we be without... Wi-Fi in all of our in our venues now. I mean, we would be shut down. So it's it it is a tricky question, Tim, about which technologies you embrace and the tap and go. And we've played with that too. And Visa's been a great partner of ours in terms of helping us innovate when it comes to payment services and payment systems. But it's a tricky one, which is that tap and go payment stuff. The problem was that the consumer never got the technology in their hands to be able to utilize it. So it didn't catch up with the, the service providers. Yep. And that so much of the cost of the infrastructure of changing the building obviously affects us that if the consumer's not adapting to it, we've put all this money into the building, and now all of a sudden it's not actually working. So I think a lot of what we have to do in terms of upping our technology is working with companies that the app is the, the way that they're able to access it, for example. Um, you know, Reed, you were talking about the, the in-arena experience. We partnered with this company uh, called Let's Move Down, and they are a uh, technology provider. There's a number of them in the space out there. There's Leap Seats. There's Pogo Seats. This, this one in particular we found the most user-friendly. Uh, but in essence, what it is is it's an app on your phone that they created a white label version for us called Devil's Ticket Upgrades. Uh, it's exclusive to our season ticket holders for the time being, but next season we're going to allow the casual fan to access it. But essentially what you're able to do is just like you could take a picture of a check now and you can um, deposit that into your Chase Bank account, for example. Once you scan into the building, you could take a picture of your barcode on your ticket and it identifies you as a season ticket holder and it identifies what account you are and where your seats are located. And then on the back end, we've uploaded a number of locations that would be upgrade locations for those folks to be able to choose from. In the phone... They're able to click on those locations, and after clicking on those locations, they get a 3D view of what the view from that seat would look like. They can choose to upgrade and pay directly on the phone, and what happens is the tickets get sent, the new tickets get sent to their phone, and you train the game day staff to be able to identify what a real ticket is by them tapping on it three times, and it's autom it, there's animation so that a check mark comes up so that our game day staff knows that it's not a counterfeit ticket that someone just you know printed on their screen and is showing to someone else. That's one piece of technology I've seen. We have another company come in and they're pitching us on uh, ads around our arena that have a chip in it, again tied to an app in your phone. So based on the, t the uh, information that we have on that consumer, we can upload exactly what Tim was talking about. You build his data warehouse and you know that that customer it usually comes and buys nachos at games. Well, we could have an ad that's a static ad up on the wall. You could take a picture of that ad with your phone, and that chip that's in there actually creates an animated ad on your phone letting you know that nachos are 25% off for this game. So it's pretty incredible where it's moving, but I think to both Jason and Tim's point is, Originally, when we were going to technology and changing our buildings, it was about the infrastructure of the point of sale area and putting in those areas to be able to tap and go. And now we have to be a little bit more um, flexible in terms of partnering with companies that are going to help us uh, with the technology on the phone itself as it's so much easier to change that technology in, the, in a handheld. 
Absolutely. Um, anyone want to jump in before I move on to the next question? All right, great. So I guess, I guess it does sort of dovetail off of what we were just talking about in terms of innovation um, on the team side. And I wanted to just go around with the three of you, starting with Eric. You guys have talked about some innovations that that you had worked with in years past, maybe that haven't worked, some things that you're starting to experiment with now. What do you three, and like I said, starting with Eric, what do you think are, are the next major developments or, or innovations with respect to the area of team business that you're working in? Or on the flip side, maybe some things that you don't think are here to stay? Uh, in my world, the biggest uh, area of focus right now is the secondary market. Um, the secondary market is this crazy animal that is, I can't describe it any better than it's the wild, wild west. So for so long you had teams uh, raising their ticket prices, raising their season ticket prices, raising their primary prices. They were adding sales reps, adding service reps, and they were realizing if we go after businesses and we go after the consumer more directly, we form relationships with them and we add more benefits, we can keep raising and raising price. Then all of a sudden StubHub came on the market I use StubHub as a broad term for the secondary market, but they were really the innovators and the ones who spend $60 million a year now to get their name out there. But what happened was, you know, you rewind 10 years ago, and you had to, if you wanted to sell a ticket, you had to put an ad in a classified advertising section of a newspaper, get someone to call you on your landline, meet you at the stadium, hand them the tickets, negotiate the price there, and then get them into the arena. So the supply that was out there, even though the supply may have been large because people were trying to get rid of tickets, the avenue to provide that supply wasn't there. And then StubHub came on the marketplace and said, hey, anyone, you can come on right now. You can post for anything. There's no rules whatsoever. What happened then was, and the reason why I gave the background of teams continuing to raise their ticket sales prices, is you had season ticket holders, your most important purchaser. They were used to paying a certain amount. Now all of a sudden, all this supply from anyone who needed to sell any game started to come on the marketplace and you had the same demand from fans who became familiar with this secondary marketplace so demand stayed the same supply started to increase brokers started to buy more tickets and realized there was inefficiencies in the market so teams were saying at the time alright I'm able to sell hundred thousand dollars more in tickets here two hundred fifty thousand dollars more in there because these guys are block buying tickets from me great this just ups my revenue number the challenge to that in the long term is there's too many tickets that are on the secondary market, high supply, same demand, the price is going to go down. So why does that hurt everyone? Because we as marketers, we're trying to continue to sell and retain our primary customer, which is our season ticket holder. Jason mentioned they built to 30,000 season ticket holders right now. That's so important to the success of that organization that their season ticket base is so high. The challenge is on the secondary market, if your price is lower than what your season ticket price is, and folks know that they can go on a game-by-game -game basis and they could pick up those tickets, they're now making the decision and they're looking at the value proposition and they're saying, oh, I'm only going to come to 25 of the 44 home games. We're only going to come to 30 of the 44 home games. Does it make sense for me to buy that package outright before I know when any of the games are taking place or should I wait it out and get those discounted tickets on StubHub? So I think what you're starting to see now is you're starting to see consolidation on the secondary market. You're starting to see teams look at brokers instead of 10 brokers here and 15 brokers there all owning 20 tickets and 80 tickets and 90 tickets and 40 tickets and there being this big mix of brokers owning your tickets all over the secondary market. There's technology out there that enables us to identify who these folks are that are buying our tickets just for the purposes of resale. To be able to take those tickets away from those folks and consolidate them to either work with one master broker, multiple master brokers, or even bring someone in internally who's going to manage your own inventory on the secondary market so you can maintain higher price floors. There's some legalities involved in, in doing that, and so still some things to be worked out, but in terms of protecting our brand and protecting the value of our tickets, it's become such an important topic because when it's wild, wild west out there and when the teams have lost control, you've not only lost control of that ticket on the secondary market, you've lost control of the way that you're able to market to your primary buyer. Great. Tim or Jason, either of you want to jump in, talk about the next major development, innovation, or, or even you know one of your challenges moving forward? Well, I'll, I'll, Tim, go ahead. Uh, sorry. 
Well, just to just to speak to what Eric was saying, uh, you know, it, it, each team's got a unique challenge. Uh, the the continued ev evolution of the secondary market and the tertiary market, frankly, because the tickets. I mean, we're seeing unbelievable numbers when it comes to to resale of our tickets. It's not just being resold once; it's being resold twice or three times down down the chain. It's really amazing. And 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 how do we make sure that um, we're protecting the value of our property, A number one. But it speaks to the importance of really taking care of your season ticket holders and giving them a reason to be a season ticket holder. I mean, and baseball's, baseball's unique. We've got 81 home games. No one goes to 81 games. I mean, I can say no. Very few people go to 81 games. So, And we only sell a full season ticket. You can't buy a 20-game plan here. So how do we continue to deliver real value to someone to be a season ticket holder when, to Eric's excellent point, I can go to StubHub and I can get a great ticket. Yeah, it's going to cost me three times what I'd pay if I bought the season ticket. What are some other reasons why we want you to be a season ticket? And location's part of that and price is part of that, but your experience with us is a big part of that. And how do we make sure that you feel like you're part of our family when it, when it, when it comes to buying a season ticket? I think that's, that's critical. Um, I would say some some of the challenges, and I think we're all facing similar challenges. And this is the first year for us from a security standpoint. What are the, the the realities of the new world, and how do we have to protect our fans when they come to a venue with forty thousand people? This year, we're we're putting in magnetometers for the first time, and you're going to start seeing that at baseball stadiums throughout the country. How do we make sure that experience is not a a negative experience for our fans? How do we make sure they understand why we're doing it and how we're doing it, and how do we, frankly, make sure that it, it, the process of getting into our facility is not a bad one? Um, those are some of the challenges that we're facing right now. In terms of opportunities going forward, I mean, it really does focus on, on the mobile device um, from one perspective. I mean, that, and there, there is a segment of our fans that clearly all they want to do is engage with us through a mobile device, whether that's social media or um, commerce, or there was a question I saw that someone asked about watching the game, uh, watching the stream of the game, and what effect will that have? All those things are going to happen through your device and, and, and payment services, frankly, as well. So I'm really excited to see where that comes together. And again, to, uh, to give credit to our partners at AT&T, they're at the forefront of helping us figure that out. Uh, and I'll mention Visa again, too. When, when is that consolidation with your with your credit card and your phone going to happen and, and we hope it happens here first and we're looking into ways to do that. And then the flip side of that really is how do you then make sure that you're not so focused on technology and mobile that you forget about the fans who frankly don't care about that stuff and all they want to do is go to a baseball game and watch a baseball game and have a hot dog and a, and a, and a beer and not be inundated with technology. This in some ways is a way for people to escape from technology. So. I think that's something that we have to be mindful of going forward to. Jason, Jason, it's so funny that you got fans on the one hand who want to go to games and want to escape the world, and then you've got that new generation of fans that literally are watching the game while they're looking at their phone, tweeting or texting their friends, taking pictures, putting up on Facebook. So we're in this interesting time period right now where we're having to market to so many different people at the same time to keep them in arena. Yep, you're absolutely right. So I would just add uh, two things. One is um, one is marketing automation, and this idea of being able to. Um, it's almost like you don't need a marketing department, right? You just have this computerized, um, algorithmic-based approach to marketing, uh, and, and I think that's really fascinating. And um, and some of the CPG companies are um, a lot further along. Than anybody in sports is in this in this category. Um, I think that's one. I think two is uh, the area that I find interesting about if you, in the NFL. You've heard Roger Goodell for years talk about how good the at home experience has become, and consequently how some of the teams in the NFL are starting to suffer on a ticketing side. Very true statement, by the way, and. Uh, and I find it really fascinating because if you think about how, you know, truly how good the TV experience is, and if we just talk football for a second, um, you know, the, the analysis, the replays, the number of camera angles, 
the you know your own you know fifty cent you know drink, uh, no traffic, you know no lines for the bathroom and so on and so forth, um, and just couple that with societal uh, kind of trends where you know we all you know, everybody's busy, you know, we don't have a full day to devote to anything anymore, and I think it's a really big problem for um, the NFL but also sports just sports teams in general. Of how do we keep up, and and can we keep up, and are we willing to invest the money that it will take to keep up, and is that the right way to keep up with the at home experience? You can make an argument that it's really not about technology and investing in technology to keep up with the at home. It's about all the traditions and the fan uh, engagement pieces that you can't get at home, right? You can't get you know, what, uh, people singing the fight song the way they do with 70,000 people. You can't get those little unique traditions. And is that enough? Um, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But if you look at the cost of infrastructure in a building, it's not cheap. And so I, I actually, I always ask myself is, can a team continue to update and innovate and be willing to invest the same speed that that innovation will occur on the TV network side. Because while we're, so for years in NFL meetings, I heard, you know, got to have statistics. Everybody wants statistics. So let's make sure all of your video boards are showing statistics. And everybody wants red zone. So let's make sure all the video boards show red zone. And let's build more big, you know, bigger boards and more of the boards. And um, that may be the right solution. I'm not saying it isn't. But I just wonder if that is truly the right solution because as soon as the teams do that, as soon as they build bigger boards, more boards, video boards, put up more statistics. Meanwhile, on this side, the networks have leapfrogged and they're doing more stuff. Um, and so interactive TV applications will be, you know, much more easy, much more prevalent. And um, I, I just don't. I just wonder if it's if it's really uh, how we win in that battle. And if we're willing to continue to invest the money into doing this. Now, I will say this. If anybody has seen the video floating around the Internet about what the Cleveland Cavaliers did uh, for their court, it's a phenomenal, uh, phenomenal video, phenomenal idea that you'd sit there and say, I've got to be there. I've got to see that in person. And that's a great example of something where um, that was a great innovation that improve the in-stadium experience to the point you'd say, I would go, I'd pay money to see that. And um, I feel in general, teams need to be thinking in those ways that we look more Disney-like than we do, um, you know, sometimes, you know, I don't want to make it sound the wrong way, but just if we can, if we can create a, an image factory a, like Disney would, um, that would be impressive. And... Uh, what I saw from the Cleveland Cavaliers was a, was a really good application of that. That's great. So if you do see along the right side, we do have some of our, our audience members that have been tuning in and asking some questions. Before we dive into those, I, I want to allow you guys um, the ability to maybe disclose some um, advice or, or career perspective for a lot of the students who are in the room who, who are interested in pursuing a career in the sports industry. So that would be my last question before we jump into the q and I guess um, if Jason, maybe you want to start being that year from 1991, we'll, we'll give you the, uh, you know, respect our elders a little here, hear your career. <laughs> That's messed up. Ow! <laughs> I was waiting to see how you segued into that. That was well done. I'm sorry. I thought maybe we go. Jason's got a beautiful hairline. I, I don't mean to offend anyone, but we're getting no, into no offense taken. Spice it up. When I, when I took when I took the the wagon out west to uh, to join the Giants, it was a little more difficult. But nowadays, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, it, it, it's funny. It's funny though that 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 was sort of your 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 intro to the question, which is I I, I you know I sort of feel a little old school when I say this, but nothing beats you know, sort of being earnest and starting at the bottom and, and working hard and being excited and interested. I mean, sports, you know, when I started back in in 91 with the Giants, um, 
you know, that was a whole different industry. And the industry has evolved in so many ways and so many cool things have happened. And there's so many more opportunities and so many more graduate programs focused on sports and sports marketing and degrees on sports. And, but at the end of the day, um, just speaking for myself and how I look at resumes that come across my desk, it's really about people who have shown an interest in pursuing this as a career and doing things that, um, you know, it is. It's starting at the bottom. I started in the ticket office. They hired me and said, you're going to be here for a month, sell some tickets, good luck. And uh, they haven't gotten rid of me yet, so maybe I'm doing something right. Um, but I, I think that really is, at the end of the day, is just really showing uh, curiosity, hard work, and willing to do whatever it takes to get started. Great. And, and Eric doesn't have his year underneath his screen, but, uh, but if, I, if I do remember correctly, I, I do think Tim might be next in line for this one. Uh, I thought you were going to go to Eric, and I was going to uh, bust his chops, which would have been great. <laughs> um, yeah, let's see. So I would tell you mentorship is huge. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're going to work in sports or wherever you're going to work for. Um, the advice that I, that I was once given and that I would share with other people is it's not so much the what you do, but who you do it with. Um, so choose very wisely around the who and less around the what. Um, that, I think, you know, everybody on this call would probably agree that in the world of sports, um, and, and again, again, I think any place is just it's paramount that you're picking the right people that you work with. So that's number one. Um, number two is I guess I will give you advice that that I um, stumbled onto myself. And I was at business school, and uh, this is in 2000. I went to business school. This is this is summer 2000, um, and I'm doing an internship at Goldman Sachs, and uh, Basically, what the way that it works with Goldman is they hire 100 you know, interns from around the country from different business schools, and it's up to you during this summer program to reach out to existing employees, set up a meeting, take them to coffee, grab breakfast, come down to their office, whatever it needs, but you have to proactively reach out to them, meet with them, and you, know, you, you kind of go through a little bit of an interview. And uh, so long story short, about halfway through the summer, I, I made an appointment. I'm sitting down on the uh, um, sales trading desk, which is basically you know computer after computer after computer, and uh, I'm sitting next to this guy who's been there for I'll say you know, five ten years. He's in technology, and uh, so I'm going through this you know meeting with him. I'm sitting right next to him, and I'm asking him the the you know the questions. Hey, why did you come to work for Goldman Sachs? What do you like about it? What don't you like about it? All that type of stuff. So like 15 minutes into this, he goes, stop, stop. He's like, I don't get you guys. Every single one of you does the exact same thing. Like, don't you get it? This is an interview. I'm supposed to be able to have this conversation with you and basically give a thumbs up, thumbs down. And yet every single one of you does the same thing. You come here, you ask me these silly sophomore questions. And I can't really tell if you're great or not. But in a year from now, some of you are going to be sitting right next to me. So if you want to impress me and you want a job, bring me value. He's like, I'm in the technology sector. There's a gazillion different things that I need to know that I can't possibly know. What's happening in the Nikkei index in the semiconductor space? What did this company do? What's a company I should be shorting, et cetera? He goes, bring me value. And that hit me like a ton of bricks because he was right. I was just asking these stupid, silly questions. And at the end of the day, what was he gonna what was he gonna say about me? Tim was a really nice guy. You know, he, he had a couple nice questions. But if if I really truly wanted a job there, I should have come prepared with here's three stocks you should be considering buying, and here's why. Here's three stocks you should be considering shorting. So the the relevant application to me is if you go to work for a company, if you're in sports, and you see your boss there till 8 o'clock at night, and you're leaving at 5 o'clock, right? Go in one day and say, hey, look, I know that there's these things that you have said to other people that are really important, creating revenue, a new business, uh, a new business line, a new revenue stream, a way to build a brand, a solution to a problem that you know is keeping your boss up at night. If you want to climb the ladder, if you want to be successful, if you want to get your next you know, promotion, that's how you do it. And just that's my that's my advice. Great. And Eric, you lastly, please. 
Sure. Um, I would say if I interviewed myself when I was 22, I wouldn't have hired myself. So I've learned from a lot of my mistakes. Um, and the first guy that interviewed me and hired me was a guy named Mark Tatum. He's actually a Cornell grad who's now the uh, deputy commissioner of the NBA. And I, I'm still shocked that he hired me at this looking back on it because I made the mistake when I was interviewing with him that a lot of people make as I'm interviewing them, which was when he asked me what I wanted to do in this industry, I said, well, I'm open to a lot of ideas and I just want to get my foot in the door and see the different opportunities that exist and then go from there. We're at the point now with the specializations that Jason talked about and that Tim talked about in this industry where schools prepare you for things and you've got the opportunity at your fingertips to be able to call people up and ask the questions that need to be asked that you can find out if it's team sports that you're interested in, if it's the agency side that you're interested in, if it's the league side that you're interested in. Dive deeper within that. Am I interested in selling tickets? Am I interested in selling sponsorships? Am I interested in brand marketing? Am I interested in public relations? When you are interviewing with that manager who's interviewing you, after you get past that uh, HR person, if you do get past them, that manager wants to know that you want to take his spot one day. So if you come in saying, I love sports, I love the thought of being in sports and working in sports, I'm coachable and I can be taken in any direction, I want to see what's out there, you're putting yourself at a disadvantage. And I know I'm asking you to be narrowly focused when I say that, but it's really important that you identify what you're passionate about. There's enough information out there, there's enough alums that you can call and ask, well, what does this area of the business do versus that area of the business? Find out what area of the business you believe you would be passionate about if you developed into a certain role that that person is in three or five years down the road. That's my first uh, piece of advice. The second piece of advice is similar to Tim's advice is find where the gaps are. I remember when I started working at the NBA, we, I was working in a department called marketing properties. And so we were in between the um, sponsorship group and the events group and helping deliver what the sponsors were looking for. And really, my value to the organization, I was this entry-level employee, but I realized that my director at the time, she was busy, and she couldn't answer everyone's questions. And so there were questions that were coming from the events group going to the marketing partnerships group about their activation and what their contract said and what could be delivered on those things. And I read each contract to find out what were the deliverables that we promised. Because it was one thing, her name was Francie, was the woman who was my boss, it was one thing if Francie was able to get them an answer, but Francie's time was limited. So if I could provide that answer to them, and they knew I was just this young guy off the street that they didn't mind bothering, well, I became an asset and a resource to them. And so if I became an asset and a resource to them, they were willing to give me more and more responsibility. And by taking on more and more responsibility, you get known by more and more people throughout the organization, and that gives you a chance to grow. So really finding where those gaps exist, not necessarily – it, the gaps in, from the standpoint of that no one in the organization knows what's going on, but there's always gaps in terms of who's working on what and who has the time to work on what, that you can find those gaps and the things that are falling between the, the cracks the, and say, you know what, I'm going to take that on. And to make, you know, to be extreme about it, if you're the guy who has to staple a lot of papers, you staple a lot of papers. Obviously, that's one end of it. But just knowing what the content is of the day-to-day you pick a number of things that you can own as your own and people are going to come to you and they're going to rally around you. Excellent perspective from all of you, obviously, differing in some errors and in the diversity of your insights. So we really do appreciate that. Like I said, we're going to take a few minutes to address some of the questions that have been posted alongside the Google Hangout as we've been going along. So. I personally, I don't want to choose any favorites. I do know a lot of the names on this list. So if you guys take a look at, at what's been posted and, you know, if one of you wants to, you know, jump up into one of the questions that you see, some of them might be addressed to one of you individually, some as the whole group. But, you know, feel free to take the next few minutes to sort of, like I said, elaborate on, on something that, that you'd like to talk about. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in really quick on one that uh, my guess is a lot of you are, you know, if you're in, uh, school right now, you're you're trying to decide, you know, what's the career path? Is it sports? Is it not sports? Um, you know, look, it's it's not for everybody. Um, I think you see these are small pyramids. 
Uh, when I talk sports, I mean I'm talking sports teams. These are these are small pyramids. So different than going to work for a a Procter and Gamble or a Coca Cola, where they say, okay, you're you're vice president of X Y Z. You've done a great job. Um, now we're going to give you the you know the Asian market to run or the North American market to run or this new product to run. You know these are really small narrow pyramids. So a lot of times that may mean that you have to move uh, and move somewhat regularly, and and you got to be comfortable with that. So that's that's you know certainly one thing. Um, it's a lot of hours. You know Jason you know gets the brunt right now with the uh, the 81 home games, uh, but I, I you know you have to recognize. What you're getting into, it is it is it is strenuous. Um, it's a lot of hours. It's a lot of sacrifice for for your family. Um, and so I, I want to. I'm trying to be realistic with you because I think sometimes you just you come into this with, oh my God, it's great, it's sports. You know, I'm gonna go to lunch and I'm gonna be sitting with you know, LeBron James, and um, you know, that's not really what what it's about. You know, I mean, I gotta be honest. Like, I, I probably count on. You know, one hand or maybe two hands. The number of times I've actually had, you know, more than a two-second interaction with a player. Um, so, if if you're going into it with the idea that you're thinking, you know, wow, I'm going to be, you know, hanging with uh, Michael Carter Williams every day, or you know, that's probably not the best reason to go into sports in terms of working in sports. Um, I think you really want to be passionate about uh, passionate about the business of sports. Um, and if you are passionate about the business sports, that allows you some flexibility. Whether it's football, baseball, soccer, hockey, it doesn't really matter. You're passionate about the business. Um, that that's that's something to consider. I'll also say this: I don't really think there's a whole lot of difference in marketing a B two C brand. Um, I see a lot of people who work for other you know, B two C companies. They're they're implementing a lot of the stuff that we do. A lot of them you know have partnerships in the world of sports. Um, I, I may be in the minority, but um, I think if you're really good at sales and really good at marketing, it transfers over to other industries. That being said, the biggest thing that, that makes our jobs harder is a variable product. So if you're at Starbucks, you can control that experience, soup to nuts. If you're at McDonald's, you can control that experience. You know, It's hard for us to control the wins and losses. It's hard for us to control the players, which makes it actually, I think, harder than a lot of other um, uh, you know, so-called marketing jobs. It's great. Well, yeah, I'll build on what, 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 what Tim was saying, just to, because I, I agree with a lot of what he said, and, and especially about the passion of, that, that's really required for what we all do, and, and clearly if you guys are paying attention to this, you, you have a desire to get into this industry, and, um, you know, first and foremost, you got to be passionate about what, what you do if you're going to commit yourself to Potentially, like Tim said, moving all over the country. In my case, I've been fortunate to be able to stay here in San Francisco. But the type of hours you put in and the sacrifices you make to to, to do this. But then at the end of the day, um, I still wake up every morning 22 years here with the Giants and am so excited about what we do and how we go about doing it. And every day is different. But I also agree with what Tim said. Which, you know, Frankly, some of the more difficult days have been days when I've had to uh, interact with with players for something, you know, because that's not really what it's about, and uh, they don't they don't understand the business side. They they're there and, and and rightly so to to be the greatest they can be on the field. And when you're talking to them, it usually has something to do with something that's not on the field. So it's a rare case when you get guys who understand that and want to interact with you uh, uh, about that. So, um, but I can't say enough about really being passionate about what you want to do and and and. Not so much because you're the biggest hockey fan or baseball fan or you know basketball fan out there, but because you're passionate about the business um, of what we do. I, and I'll just end that part of the conversation by saying I find that the folks who come in who are specifically for sports fans before they're business fans end up fizzling out quickly. And, and it's unfortunate because you see people who are ambitious, hard driving, have all the tools, but for some reason, it's they get in it, and it's because they want to be the next general manager. And nothing against that. There, there's great ways to go down that avenue. But if it's just about the passion for the sport itself, you're going to burn out in a short period of time because it's long hours. The pay relative to what your friends are going to make is not the same, and it takes a long time to move up in your career in this industry because it's so competitive. 
So all those things combined, make sure you have a passion for the business side as opposed to just the sports side. Great. On that note, we, we probably have time for about one more question. Um, if there is, again, something you do see along the right side that piques your interest, I do encourage you to sort of dive into it. Um, I, I, I see one question. I think it's from Aaron Klein, which I think really is an important one, and we've talked a little bit about the future of sports, but there's no avoiding the fact that our games are going to be streamed live, uh, and they should be, and, and again, being I guess being the... Uh, the wise old guy on the call, I'll harken back to the days when uh, people were fearful that broadcasting games on TV would would kill them at the gate. No one's going to go to the game anymore if they can watch it at TV, on TV. But it was the exact opposite, which is it builds more interest. And I think the same thing is true with uh, with streaming games. That the further we can we can we can stretch our our content, the more we give fans the ability to watch our games where they choose to, whether it's on their mobile device, on their tablet, at home, using uh, multiple screens, is all great for our industry. I think the challenge really, and, and these are challenges that can be figured out, is everyone has seen the, the um, rights fees for sports content go through the roof and beyond where anybody ever imagined they would go, and people expect that to continue. And once you start streaming those games, um, you know, who controls the rights at the end of the day? And, I, you know, again, I think uh, lots of smart people thinking about that and, and who's going to get what out of it. But um, I'm certainly seeing it in baseball that there's there's interest in, in figuring this one out. Yeah. I think, I think it's interesting to talk about how the at-home experience in terms of watching a game is changing – uh, fans desire to come to games or not when we've got someone from baseball, someone from basketball, and someone from hockey talking. It'd be fun to have someone from football talking about that only because their sport was so set up for success because you only have to come to one game a week. And that was their greatest strength for such a long period of time. And I think what's happened with the red zone and the interest in fantasy football and with HDTV their greatest strength has also become one of their greatest challenges, which is the at-home experience is so great watching every single football game all in one day. Um, I think in our three sports, because you have games taking place all different times throughout the week, that in-arena experience and that camaraderie that you're feeling amongst the rest of the fans, something that we didn't uh, uh, touch as much upon, but that in-arena experience that's created by our game presentation group um, you know, Tim and Jason, you both spoke a lot about the fact that it's not just about the sport. It's about so much more than the sport. It's about the experience itself. Our game presentation people have to be so good at using our video board to incorporate our fans into the show so they feel like they're a part of it. Examples of that are we might have a digital area where if you have an infant child that you're bringing to the game for the first time, or your son, even if he's a little bit older, you're taking the the game for the first time, you get to take a picture at that digital zone, and then we have a slideshow going up in between one of the uh, breaks in action where we're sliding through and we say, please welcome, you know, first fans of the game. And people feel like when you put them up there, when they're dancing during a certain timeout and it's some music that they like, or when they're, they're involved in a contest, the arena all of a sudden goes from 17,000 individuals to 17,000 collective people, all of whom love being there together. And if you can create that atmosphere, there's adrenaline in that, there's excitement in that, there's a drug in that that people want to keep coming back for that they don't want to miss out on. And I think that's the key is making it about that experience. If you make it about that experience and not about that team winning, people are going to keep coming back regardless of the fact that it's streaming and you can get it elsewhere because that excitement that they can feel in arena can't be replicated no matter how you provide it to them through streaming or elsewhere. And, of course, you could also affect sort of the play on the field. That, that's what a lot of people from the NFL will say, is that you can't affect the, the play on the field from your couch, and I definitely think that that's one of their, their selling points. And I guess, Tim, if you sort of want to you know, end the discussion here on, on one of those notes, jump off of what has been discussed for the past few minutes, um, that would be great, too. Yeah, actually, but I'm going to change it. Great. 
I'm gonna I'm gonna have, I'm gonna put something out there for everybody. <laughs> I need help. I need help with something. I want to do an April Fool's joke. So I want ideas. I want to see somebody can email me a great April Fool's joke that we can do. How's that? Sounds great. I hope that uh, people watching me. this are up to the challenge. Sorry, you know, go on. Uh, I can, you know, maybe it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's an opening into a larger conversation, or I just say, wow, that's a horrible idea. I don't know, but. <laughs> okay. I want to see yeah. some good ideas. Well, that's great, and and I definitely uh, think that the Cornell Sports Business Society members will be up to that task. All right. Um. On that note, like I said, we okay. are. Let me caveat uh, that one. Let me caveat that a little bit. When I say an April Fool's joke, I mean April Fool's joke that the Seventy Sixers can actually, you know, implement. Not, you know, not what you're going to do at the uh, fraternity or sorority house, right? <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. That's an important disclaimer to, to include there. So I'll make sure that I deliver <laughs> that part of the message when we when we send that out. But anyway, like I said, we are running out of time here. What I do want to do is take the moment to. Thank you three, Tim, Eric, Jason. We really appreciate you guys coming here, taking the time out of your busy day, obviously. You'll have things going on, and uh, we really do appreciate the opportunity to pick your brains, hear some perspective on your careers, as well as you know some of the topics on innovation and team business that we've been discussing today. I also want to send thanks to the Cornell Sports Business Society members who were able to join today, as well as some of the alumni, students, and faculty who are streaming this live or plan on watching this on YouTube. It'll be on the Cornell Sports Business Society YouTube page as soon as this event is done, so I do encourage people to check that out. But um, once again, Tim, Eric, Jason, thank you all so much for your time, and our mission as the Cornell Sports Business Society is to educate, connect, and promote the Cornell Sports Network. We absolutely think that we had gotten some of those tasks done today, and you know, we hope that we continue to have a strong relationship with you three and, and, and can also help you with, with some of our other Cornell folks. So thanks again for joining us, and we look forward to staying connected with the three of you. Thanks, right. man. Nice work on your end. Great job. Great job. Thanks very much. All right. Have a good one, everyone. Bye-bye.